Callaway's new Rogue ST drivers represent a breakthrough in driver performance. The Rogue ST drivers are Callaway's fastest, most stable drivers ever. Think speed, go Rogue with Callaway, the kings of distance. To find out which Rogue ST driver is right for you, visit callawaygolf.com.au. Hello and welcome to a very special episode 63 of The Thing About Golf, a combined Masters preview and peek into the life of one of this generation's most respected and influential writers. John Huggin is on the grounds at Augusta National Golf Club, and so too is Eamon Lynch. Over the past four years, the Irishman has become one of the most forthright and eloquent commentators on matters beyond the professional fairways. His coverage of Greg Norman's Saudi-led Disruptor League has been outspoken, to say the least. But where did Lynch's interest in the game come from? And how is it that he's become such an important voice? Well, listen on and find out. Here's John Huggan with Eamon Lynch. Okay, welcome to the Thing About Golf podcast with a very special edition here from Augusta National. My guest today is... One of my favourite writers. That's the first time I've ever said that with him listening. But here he is, uh, Eamon Lynch. It's the first time you've ever said it, even when I wasn't listening, John. <laughs> yeah, the, I always start with the same question on these things. And uh, what was the thing about golf for you? Or what is the thing about golf for you? I guess when I started to play primarily on an 18-hole par 3 course when I was growing up in Northern Ireland, it was more something to do in summers uh, outside of school. With friends, and unfortunately, back then I was no better than I am now. I had a vicious slice. It was OB right on eighteen holes. Which course is this? It was a little golf club that no longer exists, called Nuri Golf Club, about an hour south of Belfast. And so I spent my summers climbing over barbed wire fences to retrieve my only golf ball, usually from a pile of cow dung in the adjoining field. And it's basically been a series of ever-increasing indignities ever since then, John. Yeah, but obviously it's, it's it hooked you early. I mean, the, you play it down, I know. I mean, you're not quite as bad as you, um, you know, your Twitter persona might, per, you know, let the world know probably. But uh, Getting closer and closer well, to that Well, maybe, maybe so, but um, it, obviously there, there's something about it that's kept you in it. Yeah, because you, it, even if you're playing the same course every day, you're almost never playing the same shot. It's something else. It's it's the weather. It's the lie. It's, you know, the people they're with, the quality of the swing. It's a constantly ever-changing landscape of of the challenges of the game. And I also think it's one of those games where it doesn't matter how old you get. You always seem to be convinced that there are better days ahead. And that's not true in a lot of sports. One of the t- many, many teachers that I've dispensed with over the years, used to remind me that he had a client who was 100 years old and he took a lesson every day right. when he overlapped with well, him in he, Florida in the winter. He had to be in a hurry, obviously, at that age. You know. Well, he, this guy seemed to think that his best golf was ahead of him. <laughs> and I'd like to think at 100 that maybe my best golf might be behind me at yeah. that stage, but my best was never particularly good. I just happened to have the worst attitude in the world for my own mediocrity, so I barely play at all anymore. You may actually be on the golf course more than well, me. Well, that, that's, that's quite a boast if that's true. So what's, um, what was the lowest handicap that you reached in the midst of all this mediocrity? The lowest it ever got was five, but it was an artificial five because the golf course that I played constantly, I knew even where to miss it on every single hole. I could play that golf course blind in my sleep. Realistically, it was probably seven or eight, but that was back when I played easily 100 plus rounds a year. Last year I played seven, but I probably hit balls 125 days. I now enjoy hitting balls because I don't have to go find it. And I, I go hit balls for a couple of hours, nice go have lunch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, I, I wanted to get into your, your journalistic career, which I'm not sure I know that much about because uh, I always kind of think you're, you're far more rounded, certainly, than somebody like me who's spent his whole career writing about golf and nothing else but golf other than the couple of forays into basketball, believe it or not. But anyway, uh, yours is a bit more diverse. Um, run the, the listeners through that, if you can, at a fair pace. Well, I, ran, I, I moved here literally right out of college. I got my final results at Queen's University in Belfast on a Wednesday and was living in New York on a Saturday. Never went to my graduation because I'd gotten an internship at the Village Voice newspaper in New York and a green card at the same time. Interned there, I was supposed to stay for three months, stayed for a year and a half, 
I went to Vanity Fair, two different stints at Vanity Fair as a researcher, primarily working with Christopher Hitchens and Gore Vidal, who I thought were the two best polemicists in the English language. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, tell us more about that for a start. You know, uh, They were very, very different personalities. I always thought there was more substance to Gore. Christopher was, in a way, the better company. I mean, Gore was as patrician as they come. His father was in FDR's cabinet. And Christopher was... They're, they're interesting. They're both in the, back in the day when there was something called a public intellectual hmm. in, in this country. They were the premier examples of that, and they were both extremely combative. And that, that's a useful skill to have, or to have witnessed in the era we live in now, where everyone with access to a Twitter account is judge, jury, and executioner on your work every day. You need a kind of a thick skin yeah. on it. So I suppose I got that pretty early. I had a brief stint of the Daily News in New York, which is when I decided I wasn't ever going to work for a newspaper again, um, because it's really, even then, it was a sort of a diminishing world of mm. ever-increasing misery. <laughs> and then I just kind of accidentally found my way into Golf Magazine when Kevin Cook was the editor there 20 years ago. He asked me to go work there. I spent time at Golf Magazine and at Golf.com. And then the last few years, I, I went 10 years where I basically didn't write at all. I was editing, managing, and it's only really in the last four years, I guess, the start of 18, I started writing the column for Golf Week, and that's when I started to write more. And how much do you think the diversity of your early career influences the way you look at your job now and the game itself? I think it it helps. I think you you get a broader sense of how the media world works outside of the golf media world. I consume almost no golf content anymore because I think too much of it You're not reading me, is that what you're saying? Well, you're, you would be the exception and I'm about <laughs> to explain why, because so much of what passes for golf media content to me veers towards the sycophantic and it's the idea that there are that you're there to somehow be friends with or friendly with players. Now, if you spend enough time around these guys, you're going to develop better relationships with some than others but there is a, a tendency that you see, I think, with greater frequency these days of people who seem to think that's their priority mm. in a way that the, the actual journalism or the, the fear of upsetting a player might affect how they choose to do their job. And once you do that, then you've kind of already lost the battle. And having gone through uh, for Vanity Fair in particular, my job was essentially as a researcher to make sure they couldn't be sued. And I spent a lot of time on the phone dealing with combative lawyers and profile subjects who were enraged by the truth being told about them. Yeah. And that kind of steals you a little bit. And plus, I spent, you know, the first 10 years of my career writing about Northern Irish politics. So that kind of steals you for anything. Well, just about, I would think, yeah. yeah especially these days when you're writing yeah. about Well, there's a subject Saudis. you have to tiptoe through. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, it's definitely, I think it was a value in the sense of knowing how the broader media world works. If you start your career and only spend your career in golf media, then that is your norm. And I, there are many people in golf media who do a very noble job of, uh, of journalism, but I think there were fewer than there used to be, certainly because of the diminishing role of the beat reporter at newspapers when, mm. when I first got into golf 20 years ago. Every great newspaper seemed had a beat writer out there. Now there, you could probably count on the thumbs of two hands the number of beat writers for golf well, there are. That's the old cliche that Doug Ferguson of the AP writes for you know everybody else who doesn't have that, and, and it's virtually everybody now. You know, which is a sadness, I think. It is, and it's a loss as well because what's striking in in media these days is the absence of people looking for news. News reporting has died. There are emptying people who will give you their hot take on something. I do that as well. I get paid to write an opinion column. I have the, that luxury. But I'm struck by how few people chase news stories anymore. And it, it's a reminder of how much of the news stories would have come from those local beat reporters who stumbled upon the local angle to something and suddenly they have unearthed a, a golf story that has national ramifications. That really doesn't exist much anymore. There are some entities publishing entities in golf that have simply absented themselves from the news business by choice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't want to leave this just quite yet, but I mean, I always, 
I mean, I'm a classic one-dimensional guy. I mean, I've spent my whole life doing writing in one thing. I mean, there has to be a benefit to what you did before to what you do now, I would have thought. I mean, you come at things from slightly different angles. It's going to affect your thinking, I'm sure. Perhaps it does. I, I don't know that I can necessarily give examples or explain that. It's, I think my attitude, to, I'm an inherently political animal as well, which also sort of puts you in a different category out here, given the, the general conservative leaning nature of of golf as well. But my background is also different. You know, I grew up gay in Northern Ireland in the 70s and 80s. Um, I learned very early in life that I really didn't give a shit what anyone else's opinion was, that if it's somebody else's problem, well, then it's exactly that. It's their problem. That applies as much to um, my writing uh, as anything else. It's people are free to disagree as much as they wish. The the thing is, people seem to think that they're, they have a right to be heard in their disagreement or that they have a right for me to take it on board. It's fair enough. Sometimes if it's legitimate criticism or an argument, I'm happy to listen to anyone. I go frequently have a drink with people that I don't agree with anything mm -hmm. yeah. on. But well, the idea that's what makes me read the Daily Telegraph now and again rather than just The Guardian every day. You know, you, you should see what the other side are saying. You know. Yeah, and sometimes you actually realise that, you know, I, I had drinks with a friend of mine last night and we have fought public skirmishes over the years. And Is this Brando? No, 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 definitely not. I said a friend. <laughs> All right. Um, and although I, he was on the list last night as well. But this is somebody I would call, if I'm writing a story or a column that has, it might have no bearing on him or his professional role, but I'll call just to pick his brains because even if we agree on a subject, he'll come at it invariably from a very different angle mm. and with a different set of considerations than I do. And he'll be able to explain why X person believes this because this is their set of considerations that you're not looking at. So having that kind of sounding board is, is useful. And I, I think that's something it, I, I in a way, I can feel a little bit sorry for the younger writers getting into this business now, even the ones who are painfully absent of self-awareness, is the there's no one there from whom they learn an awful lot, I, either in terms of greatly experienced editors or other writers that they work with in the same organizations because they're few and far between. You know, when I got into this business, as when you did, there were umpteen writers that you would have the luxury of spending time in their company. I love that. As a young yeah. man, as yeah. I did with, with Hitchens and Vidal, and you learn a lot even by osmosis, much less mm. the, the fundamentals yeah, of the Yeah, I mean, craft. I, my memory goes back, since we're here at Augusta, I mean, uh, my early days at Golf Digest, we we used to have the, a big house. It was the Jonagan family house. And at night, there was a big table in the sort of dining room area. And, and at night, the, we'd have sitting around that table, Dan Jenkins, Tom Callahan, Dave Anderson, Frank Hannigan, Dave Marr, you know, all trying to outdo each other. You could stories. die of oxygen deprivation at well, that table. Well, absolutely. Too. I just sat in the corner and listened. I mean, and I wish I'd taped some of it now. I mean, it was fascinating to listen to them. I had huge respect for every one of those people. As that right, is a knock-on effect of the yeah. kind of diminishing of media in general and golf media in particular is from whom does the next generation learn because there are fewer and fewer people to do that. And it sounds like an old fuddy-duddy concept, but everybody learns from somebody along the way in every mm -hmm. craft. Yeah. And you look around the media center today and there's still quality guys up there and women, but there are fewer and fewer working in organizations where the next generation of reporters are going to learn anything yeah. because they're also not given the opportunity to practice it. It's, a lot of it is writing Chicken McNugget news items that yeah. they hope will go yeah. viral or, you know, Tiger scene doing this or you won't believe yeah. what Tiger just said, yeah, that the, kind of stuff. There's a lot of organisations out there lacking what I call the, the bullshit guy, the guy mm -hmm. who's going to say, stick his hand up and say, oh, hang on a minute, that's just bullshit. Why are we doing that? Not many people asking those questions. Well, now it's reverse. They're saying, that's bullshit, let's do that because people will click on it. It's sort of clickbait for, for traffic numbers. And yeah. so the bullshit used to be frowned upon, now it's embraced. Yeah. Before we get into it, I want to talk a bit about the Masters since we're here this week, but um, you touched on it earlier. I mean, I'll ask you one question about this subject and then we'll move on. But as being gay, I mean, how, how much of a fight has it been in golf, the golf world, which is notoriously intolerant of minorities of any shape, colour, breed, whatever? Has that been a problem for you at any point? Not at all. 
I mean, my, my attitude is simply that I'm, I'm here doing a job. I'm not looking for a date out here. <laughs> it's, it's never been an issue. It's not something I've ever hidden, mm-hmm. uh, nor would I. Um, I. I think there's a perception of golf that probably was true at one point. I think it's less so these days, this idea that it's all kind of God, guns, and the GOP over here. I think the reality of life on tour is a lot more nuanced than that. That's I think there hear. are a bunch of tour players who have gay family members um, I'm sure there are gay players out there just on the law of averages. There have to be. Uh, at what point we see an openly gay player. We've now got in Todd Montoya recently an openly gay caddy for the first time on the PGA Tour who uh, carries caddies for Brian Stewart who came out the week of the Players' Championship. But it's never been an issue for me. It's frankly never been a, a consideration really if it's like I said earlier, if it's somebody else's consideration, well then, good luck to them. It's not my problem. Well, I'm glad to hear that because you know it's it's maybe a bit of a as you pointed out there, it's a bit of a stereotype for golf, and I'm glad that the the stereotype isn't quite as true as it once was. No, there's still elements of it, I'm sure, but it's less of a certainly not something I've perceived. Maybe there are others who've perceived it differently, but it certainly hasn't been my experience. Okay, moving right along. Um, the Masters, we're, we're here at Augusta. Um, this is my, I've been here 20 odd times. I'm not sure how many you've been to, but um, how do you look at this place and, and what it represents in the world of golf? Because we're really talking stereotypes now mm-hmm. when we come to a place like this. Um, what's your view as, you know, looking at the Masters and Augusta National from a distance? I think there's many sides to that. If you're a superintendent, at any golf club anywhere in the world, it's got to be your worst week of the year because the members turn on the TV and insist their golf course needs to look like Augusta, which is unrealistic. I mean, this is a fantasy world here with not a blade out of place. I would also say that the this is the leadership of golf, for better or worse, on a global stage because so much of what happens in golf, the tone and direction is set by what happens here. And there's a tremendous overlap between the governing bodies and the membership well, of Augusta it's National. It's like the five families, isn't it? Yeah, it's a- it really is. And there's uh, one family is at the head of the table and it's not Mike Wan and it's not Martin Slumbers, it's Fred Ridley. Yeah. And th- that's where the influence really lies. They would never publicly acknowledge that fact. But given the history, I mean, I thought it was interesting last year, the Lee Elder situation uh, that I thought that was an interesting one. It's a very poignant moment that well, Elder still wasn't able to play in Augusta. He was not physically able to do it. And I thought that was as close to an apology as you were ever likely to see from Augusta National, the acknowledgement of past wrongs until the shiftless layabout son of Gary Player decided to oh. embarrass himself yeah. beyond what was obviously unavoidable with that yeah. guy. Um, but you could make an argument now for what is defined as progressivism in golf or impactfulness that Augusta National is the most progressive and impactful organization here when you look at the creation of the Latin American amateur and the Asia Pacific amateur and the Augusta National women's amateur and the drive chip and putt, things like that. I'm sure they each ebb and flow in terms of their success on on any given year, but you could make an argument that they've dragged every other organization in the game along with them, because if Augusta wants to do something, they do it. And we've now witnessed very clearly that the audience is there for the Augusta National Women's Amateur more so than it is for an LPGA Tour major being played the same week. Now, when that major moves next year, the dates probably won't conflict. But it does tell you that this, because of the intimacy of this venue, everyone's familiar with it. It it really does feel like kind of the home of American golf that nobody really gets to visit. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's it to me it's still the most impactful week of the year in a lot of ways. You know, careers are defined by what happens here. You look at someone like say Greg Norman. You know, people he played two of the finest majors ever played in the two Open Championships that he won. But Greg's career is still defined by what he failed to do here yeah. rather than the successes elsewhere. You can perhaps say the same to a degree for Ernie Ailes, mm-hmm. yeah. Tom Weiskopf, Johnny Miller. Yeah. There's a lot of people couldn't quite get over the finish line mm-hmm. here and it's, it, lives, it looms very large both in the imagination and memory 
of both players and spectators to this game and, and golf fans, but it looms even larger in the day-to-day administrative reality of this game around the yeah. world. I mean, that was that certainly was one of the great lines that when Weisskopf was commenting here when one year that Nicholas won and he's on the 16th tee and his fellow commentator says to Weisskopf, what's Jack thinking right now? If I knew what Jack Nicholas was thinking, I, I, I would have won this tournament, you know, which is... And he had, what, he had Tom had four runner-up finishes. Yeah. Here, I believe, Johnny Miller had four mm-hmm. as well. And yet... You know, sometimes it does, the breaks don't go your way. I mean, Nick Faldo, one of the great Augusta National Champions, has three top ten finishes in his entire life all, all at this one, golf course, yeah. and they're all number one. Yeah. So, yeah. And you could argue uncharitably that all three of them were, in a way, gifted to him. Ray Floyd hit it in the pond, mm-hmm. and Scott Hoke missed that putt, and yeah. Greg did what yeah, Greg did. Absolutely. He, you know, he, he took his opportunities, though. That's the yeah. other side of it, yeah. I, mean, I must admit, I, I have a hard time. I mean, I agree with a lot of what you've just said, but I, I have a hard time getting past the... The fact that this place is surrounded by a big high fence and there's guards on the gate, and I mean that that runs con- where I come from. That that's completely contrary to what and you too, where mm-hmm. that what golf is really about. I mean the the, the original egalitarian spirit of the game has been completely lost at places like this. I mean, well, you know. it's it's lost in America in general because historically, when you look at the great golf courses. They went where the money went. There's a reason why you can trace that line all the way from, say, Brookline all the way down to Seminole, because that's where the money drifted mm. as the weather turned colder mm. in the year. And it's it's always been the, the American way, I guess, where if you have a great golf course, you put a wall around it. And it's not been the case in Scotland so much because so many of the great courses in Scotland and Ireland kind of start in the town and come back to the town. You Which, don't wall yourself yeah. off from the town. Uh, and you can get on the course from the beach. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Stop you. And there are public... Yeah points of access but that, that to me the nature of the game in America is that it's there are if you looked at the top 100 golf courses in America on, on any ranking the number that would actually be accessible in some manner is probably pretty small relative to if you looked at the number of courses in in the British Isles mm. that are of similar stature almost all of them are accessible and I can only think of a couple of courses in Scotland that are so private as to be inaccessible and both of those were built by Americans. You've got to have to... Oh, yes. Well, you, I, know, I think I know which ones you're talking about, but yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a very good point. See, again, you're coming at it from a different angle. That, that That's not something I've ever thought of before. You know, this is why you're on, of course, Eamon. You know. It's also the, the influence runs deep. I mean, I'm always struck when I go to Kings Barnes, a golf course I love, which is obviously accessible, but it's... The prescribed pace of play the last time I was at Kings Barnes is closing in on five hours. Mm. I mean, you'd be hung, drawn and quartered if you were Scottish or Irish mm. and going out to play in that time. You'd expect to be at least on your second bottle of wine back in the clubhouse yeah. at well, five hours. Yeah, I mean, I'm with you there. I mean, I got to the point of, in my life where I, I, I couldn't play in medals unless I was first off because it just drove me crazy. By about the 12th, I just had enough, you know. I mean... It's, it's a bit of a problem that that, that slow play thing. Anyway, I, I want to drag you back to the to the Masters. Um, you come here to to a tournament like this, and what is your mission, if you like? I mean, what are you thinking professionally? What's the what's the plan? I never come looking to see who shot what on any given day. That game stories like that don't really interest me. I tend to go around looking for interesting people to talk to, or if there's a newsy angle or something happens. I much prefer to write subjects that are, I suppose, more transient in a way that they're just, there's a little meat on the bone. I, if I f- end up writing a game story that talks about somebody's performance on the course, it's a sign really that the well was dry and I couldn't find another subject. I mean, one of my favourite moments, you and I were talking about this earlier, by the clubhouse a couple of years ago, I just, in one day I ran into several people who had come painfully close to winning the Masters at Augusta National. And I remember one of them, Curtis Strange, who, you know, Curtis began with a four-stroke lead in 1985, having shot 80 in the first round. That's right. And he rinsed balls on 13 and 15 in the final round and eventually lost to Langer. And I asked Curtis, this is going back about four years, I asked Curtis what, how long it took for the sting of that to go away. And he just kind of looked at me with a very thin smile and said, you mean it does? Yeah. And I'd asked other players the same thing over the years, guys like Lanny Watkins, Tom Kite, and nobody ever played Augusta National better for longer than Tom Kite without leaving with a green jacket. I mean, I, I think he's got nine top five finishes. Yeah. And if you want a tribute to longevity, Tom Kite was second 
in Jack's last win and in Tiger's first win. That's right. Yeah, 19, well, a very distant second in Tiger's first one. He won the Mortals division, though. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit like Hubert Green at Turnbury. He said that he won the tournament he was playing in, the one that Jack Nicholas and Tom Watson didn't participate in. Um, so what... Um, I mean, I'm getting older and more cynical, and I, and I don't like that aspect of my personality as I get that way. But And nothing actually brings that out in me more than places like this. I mean, do you actually, do you still look forward to coming to a Masters? I do in some ways. I also look forward to leaving a Masters at the end. It's a long week. And these tournaments can often be long weeks, which, you know, people listening to this would rightfully say that we're just two arseholes complaining about yeah, a week. I agree. Augusta yeah. National, but yeah. they, they can turn out to be long days. And that's true of, of most major tournaments, especially if you're, doing double duty on stuff if you're doing radio or, or TV as well as writing or you've got multiple overlords that you're writing for at the same time which happens more and more these days but I do like coming here because not so much for what happens on the golf course in, in terms of the work I do it's more useful to talk to people who aren't aren't players I don't really talk very much to players at all to be honest but everyone you could possibly need to see and get any kind of information, whether it's useful today or a year from now, you will find them if you stand under the tree outside the Augusta National Clubhouse for a few hours. They are going to pass within your field of vision. And to me, that's the value of this game needs a meeting place. You can see now the, the PGA show in Orlando in January is kind of diminished with COVID. Also, most of the big endemic equipment manufacturers have decided it's not worth the spend anymore. So it's it's shrinking. But you could argue that this game still needs a meeting place. Why? Because I think it's a game also that's built on relationships. And it's otherwise it's a very it's a transient sport. And people are moving around all the time. You know what it's like at the open, particularly at St Andrews, where it's a similar vibe just anywhere in the town. You're walking along the street with a bag of fish and chips, you could run into some agent that you needed to talk to or Someone else. The players uh, no. wander around in St Andrews, exactly. you know, which you can, they don't do anywhere else. Yeah, you can end up sitting. I remember having dinner in North Berwick during the Muirfield Open in 2013. And there was a different player at the table next to me in this little cafe every night. And you don't get that at other golf tournaments very often. But the Open and Augusta, I would argue, are probably about the only two real meeting places left in terms of the professional game where you're going to see pretty much everybody, including plenty of people you don't want to see, but anybody you do want to see is going to be here. That's true for not just for us. I mean, the, I bumped into a friend of mine who works for the RNA this morning. And there, there's all kinds of stuff going on behind the scenes at the, at the Masters, and they think it's the same at the Open. Yeah, and it's very much... There's a lot of high-powered a, meetings. Yeah, it's, it's the... A lot of decisions are taken in meetings that happen this week, even sitting under an umbrella outside the clubhouse. I so, you know, Keith Pelly was there earlier, Guy Kinnings, Martin Slumbers. They're all sitting there kind of, you know, working in the shadows. And this mm. is the kind of week where that happens. Yeah. Do you think um, the game is headed in the right direction, given the, these decision makers that some of them we just mentioned? I mean, where, where, where are we headed with all this? In what respect? Well, the professional, let's start with a professional game, which is completely different from, you know, there's the old cliche about how if the professional game disappeared tomorrow, it wouldn't make any difference. The, the club down the street would still be full on Saturday morning with guys playing in their four balls. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, we're going to get into equipment in a little bit. I mean, the, you know, we talked about the, the guys from earlier on, Weisskopf being a classic example of somebody that, I'm not sure there's too many guys out there playing like Tom Weisskopf anymore or Lee Trevino or Sebi. I mean, I bang on about this. Probably the listeners will be sick of it, but... That is a subject that disturbs me. I mean, it's it's not the it's not as much fun to watch, and I can't imagine it's as much fun to play. Because, but a lot of them don't realise that they could be having a lot more fun. And, the, and some of the players, when I start writing and talking about this sort of subject, they take it as criticism of them. It's not. It's criticism of the game at that level. That's what's less interesting to me. Not the players, because the players, if you gave them the old gear, they would adapt and play just the way that. You know the, the other guy, the older guys did, but that's lost, and it, it's a sadness to me. Yeah, it's lost, but it's lost to spectators. I think it's wrong-headed or generous to assume that the players have any interest in fun. 
mm. because it's striking, and I'm sure you've noticed this over the years. I could honestly count on one hand the number of tour players I've known who play golf recreationally for fun. Mm. Like Brad Faxon plays all the time. He does, I've done that. And I've even when them. he was yeah. on tour, Brad played all the time. Mm. Most of them don't. For most of them, it's a job. They're not looking for a test of imagination or intestinal fortitude or anything like that. They're looking for a test of execution because that's what they've worked on. So to get into kind of course setups or equipment or anything like that, to me, it all comes down to what the game is asking of elite players. And that to me is increasingly one dimensional execution. That's what made that uh, second round of the players so fascinating to me was the idea that these guys actually had to shape shots to meet the conditions. And Keegan Bradley had a, a wonderful line where he said there were no yardages out there. You simply there were just trajectories and you had to pick your window and shape your shot. Whereas, you know, Kepka told me that he was playing with Scotty Scheffler when Scheffler hit it in the water. Um, 17, Brooks was also in the water, but Kepka hit, Kepka hit, I believe, eight iron that didn't come anywhere close to dry land. Scheffler hit six iron, kept it low, but he kept it so low that it was actually stayed below the wind in the grandstands in the background. Yeah. So it didn't affect it as much. Yeah, it went over. And he goes over the green. Oh. But to me, it was just a fascinating day of watching. It's why I love watching the Open, because the Open, it, it's not just that it tests stoicism and patience, which is why, you know, Tom Watson's won five and Bubba Watson has won none. Yeah. It's it, the, the imagination gets kicked in there where the most interesting part of the ball's journey happens when it hits the ground. Well, you get a bit of that here too, to be fair. You do. Yeah. And thank, what I'm happy, one of the things they do very well here is, you know, there's going to be a lot of rain here Tuesday, possibly on Thursday as well. But this is a place because of their, what exists underground here, they could, within reason, create whatever playing conditions they wish to have. Yeah, they can, they've got a winning score in mind and they can pretty much get within a shot of it every year, I reckon. And yeah. when's the last time you ever heard any player, which speaks more, I think, to the cowardice of players, but you never hear them say Augusta National lost the golf course. Now, Augusta National doesn't lose the golf course, but there are plenty of times when the USGA has been accused of losing the golf course where I thought it was just sour grapes from players who weren't equipped yeah. for the challenge. Yeah. But the players are very deferential to what happens here yeah, as well. Which is not to say that the, they haven't crossed a few lines here. I mean, the, the, we've had, you know, images of world-class golfers putting off greens and into lakes and things. And, you know, that's where I, I draw the line. You know, that, that, that's not golf. Well, it is something of a statistical improbability to lose a ball on a putt, but I did it yeah. on the eleventh hole here <laughs> once as well. So, right, yeah, it's, yeah. But I mean, you, there are always you, we can always point to situations where conditions got away from the governing bodies, whether it's in major championships. Sometimes you see it in regular tour events as well. It happens. It to me, it's more of an issue. Does it happen repeatedly? And in a way, the USGA has probably been closer to that than than any other body because I do think they have had a history of trying to protect a particular score. And they, it has at times come dangerously close to Mickey Mouse setups mm -hmm. to protect that. Yeah. I think it's it's less so now maybe than it was, but there's still that sentiment that exists. And I'm sure they have scores in mind here as well. But, you know, this course holds up remarkably well, given that, you know, when Cameron Smith finished second here to Dustin Johnson in the November Masters in 2020, when the golf course was essentially like a dartboard, yeah. it's so soft. He was still the first guy in the history of this tournament to shoot four rounds in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And that has now become essentially routine in every other major championship. Yeah. And so they're still they're still doing something right. And I don't know there's little tricks here and there. If you mow the fairways back towards the... Mm -hmm the tee to prevent a little bit of roll and we've seen changes now here. The 11th hole where some of those trees controversially erected some years ago have now been removed again. But it's still, to me, it, it does ask more of players than most venues. It's, there's still that test of imagination, particularly around the greens. I mean, there's a reason Seve won here twice. Yeah. Callaway's new and improved Chrome Soft family of golf balls is better for everyone. From amateurs to major winners like John Rahm, Phil Mickelson and Annika Sorenstam. Now with Callaway's proprietary new precision technology, 
The Chrome Soft family delivers Callaway's highest quality, best performing and most consistent golf balls. To learn more about precision technology and the new and improved Chrome Soft, Chrome Soft X and Chrome Soft XLS, visit callawaygolf.com.au. That's what made me laugh out loud. I mean, literally, um, when the that day at the players that you just described recently, where you know Justin Thomas and Bubba Watson were held up, as this was just fantastic what they did. You know, well, if that's fantastic, why are we not doing it more often? Creating, you know, we've we've gotten away from that because of the equipment. Well, it's also that that was brought on by the weather, yeah, not by design, and you don't you don't see. You don't see weather like that, frankly, very often in it. But the course setups are often too unvarying. It, I think it encourages a certain one-dimensional attitude to golf that you see on tour week in and week out. And Bubba, to me, is a fascinating case in that sense. When you look at nobody plays golf with more artistry than than Bubba Watson does now since Seve. I mean, you just yeah. watch his ball fight right. and it's remarkable. It's all self-taught. And you think the Open Championship should be this beautiful, inviting campus for a guy like that. But Bubba can't process the vagaries of golf. There's a reason he's won twice here, because the fans are not going to be an issue. There are no hecklers here. There aren't people walking in the wrong place. It's a cathedral where he can be on the altar and he's unbothered by the worshippers. That's not true in the Open. There's a lot of vagaries going on there where the simple reality that you can hit a wonderful shot that gets a lousy result. And a lot of guys aren't wired to accept that. Mm -hmm. And that's what I find remarkable about Bubba's record here versus the Open Championship. And I suppose it speaks very differently to the Open versus the Masters in terms of the randomness of the Open is still there to an extent, not just weather related, but there's a lot going on Mm -hmm. at an Open that just doesn't, yeah, I mean, it's, it, again, it's an old cliche, but the, and it's still true. I think that the 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 more interesting golf gets, the longer the ball spends on the ground. You know that that's what it should be. I mean, the bounce and the roll should be a bigger percentage of what goes on than it is certainly on the American tour. Yeah, I remember having an argument with Brandel or somebody a couple of years ago. No, every, certainly sure no. not. You know. When Dustin Johnson hit that shot in Kapalua where it was on a par four and he hit it to a couple of inches. And Brandl argued that it was a terrific shot, maybe one of the best shots he'd ever seen, if not the best, because his argument was there was a very small window in which DJ had to land that ball to get where it was. My argument, and he said, you know, it's the perfect combination of distance and power. My argument was that by far the most interesting part of that ball's journey came after it touched the ground and started riding the contours. And that's why I love, even now as disaffected as I've become by my own golf game, what will get me out is a golf course where I just find it interesting the closer you get to the business end of the hole. Uh, you know, I look at Sawgrass, not a, I love that as a test of target golf. It's not golf I have any interest or ability to play, but I don't see out there a better example of a course that asks you to go from point A to point B. But the golf that that I love playing and the golf that I love watching is the golf that presents greater options to players because to me, like the seventeenth hole at Sawgrass, which sure prevents a lot of drama out there, it does all of that if it's entertainment. But to me, live or die are not options. And I you know, I think it was it was a tiger or a Jack who once said that it would be a great eighth hole at Sawgrass because it's um it does give you the chance if it was the eighth hole to recover before the end, but it's also true that it is the eighth hole for half the field on any given day. Mm. So the, yeah. you know, the, the argument kind of falls down a wee bit, doesn't it? It, it falls down <laughs> on the, certainly on the weekend, yeah. that when it's the 17th hole for everyone. But it's, you know, there's a difference. I think it was a peak die was once likened to the difference between car crash golf and plane crash golf in that one would offer you the chance of the unlikely or improbable recovery. Yeah. yeah. And too much of what you see in elite tournament golf these days diminishes the recovery, particularly when you see just this uniformity around the greens where everyone's sort of chopping out of the rough. It's whereas you, you know, kind of you shave down the banks and it's, you see a lot 
better distinction between the mediocre or good chippers versus the great chippers. Yeah. I mean, Jeff Ogilvy um, once had a great line about the, the rough round the greens. He said, you know, he says it's he says it's an awfully boring shot, he says, but we do get awfully good at it. You know. Yeah, and it's, as it, that is really the point. It's a test of execution. Yeah, and that's yeah. all it is. Yeah, you don't see that so much here, though. I mean, I, 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 we're probably wandering off the subject of the Masters too much here, but... Uh, it's um, you, you do see shots here that you don't see anywhere else it's on the on this side of the Atlantic. I don't. I think except maybe at Shinnecock, you know, and they they've crossed the, definitely crossed the line there at least twice. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. I think you see a lot more. You don't get many even lies out on any of these fairways mm. at Augusta, and it's frequently you're being asked to play a perhaps a draw with the ball a little bit below. Your feet, not to the extremes that you would see at, say, Olympic Club, one of the most hugely overrated oh, courses yeah, in the country. Yeah, I'm with you there. Yeah. But it's it, there is a variety that is demanded of people here. But I also think it's become this remarkable test from the neck up as well because because of the intimacy that people have here. Even the players know where and how their predecessors in past generations succeeded yeah. or failed here. They remember... There's so many great things yeah. that have happened here. And Tragic particularly things. On that if you can use that nine. word in golf. Yeah. yeah, right from, I suppose, from that approach shot to nine where you've seen people suck it back all the way back down to the walkway, yeah. all the way mm. home from there. So they're all familiar with it and I think that's why it becomes a much more demanding test from the neck up for elite players here because it's so much more enormous in their mind of where the landmines are. They know they're coming up. It's not, there's no chance to it the way there is at other tournaments. And they've probably screwed up at some point before. So that's in the head as well. Yeah, they they all have their own scar tissue. And to me, part of the test of elite sport ought to be the ability to summon clarity out of potential chaos and fear. And the ability to do that is why Jack has won six times here, why Tiger has won five, why Faldo has won three, and why Greg Norman is working for a regime of murderers. That's ultimately why, because when it mattered here most, Greg couldn't get it done. Yeah, I it mean, does that to people. It was it was the it was, it was fascinating. Nineteen ninety six. It was the inexorable de- de- decline. It wasn't as if it just happened. It wasn't a bad shot that finished in the water. It was just this slow, gradual. And it, man, it was hard to watch, in a way. It, you had to have a wee bit of empathy for him as a golfer to watch that because it was agony. Yeah. It was, and it's, it's happened before. I mean, it's a certain bit of, you know, this legend that Greg has to an extent of, you know, being snake bit mm-hmm. in the majors. You look at having lost consecutive majors by guys holding out, Bob Tway, hold out of the bunker. Yeah, Inverness he played the back in 1940. He did, and then when Larry Mize chipped in, here in 1987, people forget that Greg made six bogeys in that final round in 1987. Mm. Greg was in the playoff because of Greg. Yeah. And, but Augusta National does that. The people we've seen, great, great champions over the years, just come somewhat unraveled here. Just that little bit, not necessarily in yeah. as dramatic that, a fashion as That's one as of Greg. the best things about the course as well, is that it creates that. You know, not every, not every course can do that. Yeah, because there are a certain series of shots on the back nine that where you basically just have to stand up and actually execute yeah. the shot. And the margin for error is slender and the punishment for a miscue mm-hmm. is great. And a lot of guys, they all know where those shots are. They know they're coming. And a lot of guys just are that little bit off when it matters more. Some people get lucky and it. Others just don't quite have the stomach for it at the end. Which brings me to Rory, mm-hmm. one of our both our, our favourites, I think. Um, that sounded a lot like the way Rory plays. I mean, Rory lives on the edge, I think. I mean, it, which it makes him hugely attractive to watch and great fun to watch. And maybe that he's maybe he's just too close to that edge for this golf course. I mean, what do you think? Is there anything to that theory? I think if there, if Rory has an issue with this golf course, I'm not convinced it's a playing issue. I think the issue is this should have been his first major win back in 2011 yeah. when he lost the four-stroke lead and kind of imploded, cried on the back nine. Um, the He's now, he's still only, what, 32 years old, mm. about to turn 33, yeah. and this will be his eighth attempt at completing the career Grand Slam here. No one's ever competed, competed the career Grand Slam here. 
I, I have to think it's an it's a, an awful burden to carry around from your mid twenties that suddenly you have one thing left to accomplish in golf, yeah. and it's to win here. Yeah. Knowing, but everything, something has to be last every and everything like that. Exactly, you know, but so. the, again, it brings us back to the kind of the intimacy and the familiarity with the landmines and the history and the yeah. triumph and tragedy of of this game around this particular golf course over the years. And Rory's, I think, tried to take different approach to it. If you go back to 2018, he had a mental game guru following him around literally at his heel uh, day after day and he was downplaying the idea of the majors trying to de-stress them. And it didn't last very long because Rory, he told me after the fact that he he realised that he kind of needed that bit of an edge to it. The, the idea that you can treat it like any other week can be counterproductive. And so he's tried that some, some years he goes out there he just doesn't have the game he's a lot of top 10 finishes since then the only one that I thought he was a had a real chance at was 18 when he lost to Patrick Reed right, yeah. he had a dreadful range session mm-hmm. before it pulling everything to the left so when he went to the first tee overcompensated and blasted it a mile right into the trees and in fairness Patrick Reed went out that day and shot a solid round of golf yeah. and he had a two stroke no lead starting yeah. yeah but Rory would have had to play a, a very high level of golf to beat him. Yeah. Kind of, it was right. not beyond expectations or reasonable expectations. Didn't happen. But he's got a lot of backdoor top tens here when he wasn't really in contention. And yeah, you know, it looks all right in paper from a distance, but at the time, nah, he was, he was never going to win. You know? Yeah. And so. I think I'm, I wouldn't necessarily feel terribly confident about his chances this year. He's actually putting a lot better than he has been in the past, or at least by reputation. He hasn't played enough rounds on tour this year to qualify for official rankings in the strokes gain category. But right now, his strokes gain putting rank is in the mid 30s. And, you know, if you hit the ball as well as Rory does at his best, or even when he's playing reasonably well, you only have to be a middle of the pack putter. Right. But going into Bay Hill, Rory was leading the tour in strokes gain putting in, in the rounds that he played. But to me, the, the weakness in his game right now is, is trying to fight. To, to rediscover his swing is the approach shots and there were pretty lousy numbers last week in San Antonio and it's hard to imagine there's a more important aspect to the game going around this golf course mm. than where you can position your I mean, approach It's a very different shots. golf course. I don't like that course in San Antonio. It's it's a weird golf course. You know, I've only been there once but off the fairway it's like, you know, you're out in the desert. I mean, it's ridiculously how penal it is, you know. Yeah, and it's... Yeah. I'd, I don't necessarily think it's a particularly good warm up for a place no, like this. It's the opposite of here. Yeah. yeah. But it's, you know, some guys want to just be competitively sharp. And, you know, Rory, back when he was winning majors in between 11 and 14, Rory would frequently play the week before a major championship. So I think he's, again, he's just dabbling here, trying to remain competitively sharp. Hmm. That's why he sat out the match play, because he wanted his preparation for Augusta, whether it was going to be good or bad, to at least be stroke play. Um, so he's, you know, he tried to work his own way around it. Nobody would be surprised if he won here. No, no, not at all. Nobody would be surprised if he won by a mile yeah. on Sunday, but nobody would be surprised if he was 20th either, because it's there's a little bit of inconsistency in there right now. And it's kind of a, there, there's, you add the pressure of trying to complete a career Grand Slam onto a little bit of uncertainty around your full swing right now and it's probably not a great recipe but this is also the kind of place where guys like over the years like a Crenshaw and a Spieth who've been in the absolute doldrums get mm. some elixir when they come down Magnolia Lane and suddenly yeah. they're, yeah. they find something. But it certainly it gets in their heads. I mean, no, you, you touched on Patrick Reed's last round there but the, the classic example is Tiger three years ago here, 2019. I mean, he went out, he wasn't leading and he shot 70 in the last round which is fine but not exceptional and you don't normally win coming from behind with a 70 in normal conditions which is what prevailed that day I mean the, they just fell away like snow off a dike as they say in Scotland yeah. I mean this place has got more demons floating around that can get in their heads than maybe anywhere else Yeah when you look at the 12th hole that then it was you know Molinari and yeah. Poulter and Kepka. Fina. they're all in the water yeah Finau as well and but Tiger was you know, between the two bunkers in the middle of the green yeah. where he always is. And that's, to me, you know, that was sort of Tiger's strategy in the same way that it was Jack's strategy, that there are certain guys who are going to take themselves yeah. out of it. Hang, Jack ar- didn't win. Hang, hang around until they do. You know. Exactly. Jack yeah. didn't win 18 majors 
by shooting 63. Every Sunday, Jack won them by shooting what was enough to put himself in the mix. That's why he was also second mm. in 19 of them, yeah. which is a remark. I mean, you're talking about almost a decade's worth of finishing first or second in majors. Yeah. It's, these are events where guys are more likely to get wobbly at the end. And Tiger was the only one who didn't blink. And to me, that's the value, not just of his experience, but it's, there's value to the institutional experience of Augusta National and having been there and seen it happen before. Yeah. Yeah. And people love to tune in and watch that. I mean, there's nothing more fascinating for everybody else is to watch somebody you know, imploding. That was the great fascination of Norman it was the slowness of it, especially for me. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I've talked to Faldo about it and he said he first noticed um, that there was a real problem on the 8th where Greg was re-gripping, 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 you know, far more than he'd done previously. And Faldo, that was when the light bulb went off and Faldo said, I can win this. Yeah. I, I wrote a story many, many years ago uh, for now defunct magazine, but I asked a bunch of elite players for the one shot of their career that had gone wrong, they that want they over. most wanted over. Yeah. And I was striking how many of them picked Shots at Augusta National. Seve picked that four iron into the water in yeah. the final round in 1986. That was an 15. obvious one, yeah. yeah. And, but Gary Player talked about uh, a bunker shot that he sculled over the green to lose to Arnie in, I believe it was 1962. Well, uh, Arnie the previous year, did the Arnie, same thing. Arnie picked one mm -hmm. because he'd accepted congratulations from somebody outside the ropes coming yeah. off the 18th tee, yeah. Yeah. put it in the greenside bunker didn't save par yeah. and handed the tournament to Gary. So in consecutive years, yeah. they had handed the tournament to each other mm -hmm. on the 18th hole. But uh, I I remember sitting here just right upstairs from where we are now in 2018 on the Saturday with David Duval and we were watching Reed tee off in the third round. And, you know, Reed had never been in that position in a major championship before. And we were just discussing how tough it generally is to hang on for guys not only who haven't been in that position, but who have not been in that position here. And David, of course, had four straight years from 98 to 2001 where he had a real chance to win the Masters. Yeah. And he could tell you in detail how each of them came about mm. th that particular failure to do so. And I said to him, OK, well, your last shot at winning the Masters was 2001. A few months later, he won the Open Championship. Did that ease the pain of the failures here? And David looked at me as though it was the dumbest question he'd ever been asked in his life. And yeah. finally just said, no, yeah. as yeah. though it was just a ridiculous sentiment. But that's what Augusta does to people. People are more struck by the near misses here than the successes somewhere else. And you don't see that very often. Maybe, maybe there are tennis players who fell short at Wimbledon, like Andy Roddick yeah. in that Wimbledon final in 2009 against Federer yeah. when he, he loses 18-16 and Hedman 16 in would be another set. example yeah. there yeah so. it's you know there are people who have had shortcomings on the greatest stages in their sport they've won on other great stages but the greatest stage of all which mm -hmm. you can make a reasonable argument is Augusta National however soft spot we have for the old course mm -hmm. but in terms of the great theatrical stages in this game people will remember everything that happened here yeah, good because it's every year as yeah. well yeah which definitely helps um, do you think um, in your heart of hearts that Rory is going to do it I think if I was going to bet on it I would say yes because what is he now he's about to turn 33 you could easily argue that if he stays motivated Rory's got another 10 years mm -hmm. of it and now it, whether he backs into it because somebody else gets wobbly at the end or whether he goes out and, and wins it in a dramatic fashion I don't think Rory would care one way or the other No, I think he'd be quite happy to have somebody <laughs> yeah, whatever, back yeah. into it um, I do think there's an enormous pressure on him because of the Grand Slam conversation that's going on um, he's been out of sorts with his swing now basically he was playing sublime golf before the pandemic cancelled yeah. the 2020 Masters and that might have been a great opportunity for him because he, he was on a run of nine straight top five finishes before that player's championship was mm. cancelled. Yeah. And it's never really been the same since because at the end of 2020, after the, they came back from the pandemic, he was struggling with his game when he got here. Last year, he was struggling with his game. He had just started working with Pete Cowan at the time. And now he's back here this year, back with Michael Bannon as a swing coach. And he still 
trying to find a little something. Yeah, I mean, I think he's. I think he's going to win the Open this year. That place is made for him. I mean, as he's shown it before. I mean, apart from that ridiculous 80 shot in the second round I mean if he'd had the same draw that Louis Eustazen had in that open he would have won it by about 15 shots seriously you know but that's you know I suppose yeah. that's the luck of the draw in this game isn't it yeah. sometimes things break your way and other times they don't I think there's a the worrying thing with Rory there's a perception that when the going is tough that, that he doesn't quite have enough grit to hang in there that he gets frustrated yeah. too easily and there, there may well be something to that he would probably Denied, he has denied it in, in conversations that I've had with him. I've never seen evidence of complacency with him. I've spent l- probably a lot of time with Rory in the last three, four years. I've never seen a scintilla of evidence for complacency. I would suggest that losing doesn't hurt him enough. Mm. And I think it's, it's very different. Rory's very happy in very many aspects of his life. He's interested in his business stuff, yeah. the family stuff, all of that. So he's, and he keeps saying he's not going to be defined by who he is as a golfer, which mm. is very easy to happen. I mean, I still remember Colin Montgomery's ex wife giving a, an interview once where she said that which the one? kids, the, the first one, <laughs> right. that the kids would check the leaderboard uh, at the golf tournament because they w- wanted to have a sense of what mood daddy was going to be in when he came home, which I thought was a shocking indictment of how. Yeah this game can affect you as an individual and everyone around you. And Rory's the exact opposite of that. But there's a little fine line between that level of balance or happiness or perspective that everyone likes to talk about versus the the losses burning you. And that's why I think it's been a good sign. The torn shirt in Dubai that everyone made a big deal over. I was there, I saw that, yeah. (laughs) Or a a club toss here or there. To me, these are actually good signs the angrier he gets yeah, because yeah. It, it shows you there's a little edge and he's just pissed off yeah. at not yeah, delivering I would never what he should criticise him for any of that stuff I mean that's just that's what you, that's perfectly human reaction and it, to me it's a good sign that he's it's bothering him that he's not delivering what he's expecting yeah. to deliver that he thinks he's playing well enough to deliver and then comes up short yeah. and I mean he got absolutely shafted good. in Dubai when before the the shirt turning. I mean, when he he was leading by one, and he hit this beautiful shot and hit the pin, and it rebounded back into the bunker. Yeah. You know, bogey from that was a two shot swing right there. Yeah. And if he birdied that hole, it was done. It was over. You know, the more temper we see, the better. Now you can go on the flip side of that very easily as well, and see guys who just seem to live in a woe is me existence. But and I, I think he's a long way from that. But showing a little bit of edge, a little bit of fire. That's kind of what you want to see out of Rory now because I do think it needs to hurt him a little bit more than it otherwise yeah, would. Yeah. It doesn't impact his life mm-hmm. in any he's real meaningful roundy, sense. Which is going to make him a yes, better human being but yes, not necessarily a, a better normal. golfer. We yeah. need him to be a bit more like us, a little more sort of yeah. discontent yeah. Yes. would be good. Yes. Uh, before we leave the Masters, I, I know the certainly I want to hear what you've got to say and the listeners will too about a certain Middle East country. But um, Tiger, what do you make of Tiger playing this week? Possibly playing at this point. I think point. it's terrific for the yeah. game. I mean, we, I was just standing up by the clubhouse when Tiger walked by heading to the putting green and the roar went up as though it was a Sunday afternoon. Mm. And, you know, we, we spend a lot of time in this game, John, talking about the great the great stories invariably involve athletes getting over the finish line or not in some cases. But this is a great story of someone even getting to the starting line. Given where we were 14 months ago, mm. the idea that he could play and be competitive at the Masters. And if he's not competitive, it it is most likely to be a lack of competitive sharpness. The the word worry for me is, is he going to be able to walk around for four days? Especially if suddenly the ground is slippy from rain and he's he's walking a little more gingerly. I don't have any doubt about him being able to hit the shots. I mean, there's a question mark over his lack of competitive play. Obviously, he hasn't played more than a year in a proper tournament but, but he doesn't need that here because he possibly, already knows possibly not every yeah, ripple of grass yeah, yeah exactly here. but I, I think yeah. the the interesting thing is you know he's here because he's stress testing the body and whether it can hold up but that to me that tells you that he believes the swing is good enough to be there on Sunday afternoon yeah. and it would be a tremendous story is it any more improbable that he could be there in contention on Sunday evening given where he was if you go back to when there was the other back surgeries and the chipping yips Hmm. issue that he had uh, that he 
redeemed himself from that and won a major 11 years after yeah, his last one. Yeah. It's, you know, he's, he's chipping, a guy who should not be yip, written off. Chipping yips is an oh, incredibly destructive thing for, you know, anybody, but certainly at that level, I mean, you're you're done if you've basically got chipping yips. And, and, and there's, the it's, player I've ever seen who's actually managed to make well, it work. I've, I don't know if you've ever seen any I've of that. I've seen a few guys with it and it's driven them, they've disappeared, you know, because of it. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, man, it's a horrible thing, you know, so... Anyway, I, I don't think he can win, but I, I can. I'd love to see him play this week. No, but if he, it's almost like twenty nineteen over again. If he can put himself in the mix, uh, yeah. just his Who name being there what is enough do to, to make the others lose. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. because they all got wobbly, and I, I refuse to believe that it wasn't simply a, a factor that it was oh, Tiger Woods absolutely. name sitting there. Yeah. And the same reason Norman did what Norman might not have done. What he had done had there been somebody else on the leaderboard behind him. But the last guy he wanted to see in the rearview mirror was Nick Faldo because yeah, yeah. he knew Faldo wasn't going to be Yeah, himself. Faldo was, he said... And to his credit, Faldo yeah. shot the best round of oh, the, the day. a beautiful round of golf. Yeah. In the final round. But the most important shot for Faldo that week was the putt he held on the 18th on Saturday to get into the last group. Yeah. You know. Because he, and that was maybe the most impactful putt for Greg was one that he didn't even hit as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Anyway, um, moving right along, I think... Um, I want to come at this from a, from a, from a, a slightly different angle. In that, what have you made of the um, the PGA Tour um, reaction to this threat, if you can call it that, from the Saudi based and the other crowd uh, to the supremacy of the PGA Tour in the world of golf, pro golf, anyway? Predictable, overdue, not necessarily as coherent. As it should be. I mean, there there are plenty of shortcomings with the PGA Tour product. Mm. It's and a tired product a lot of weeks. I it think. is, and we mm. see too much of the kind of the same tired format, the same tired venues, the kind of the endowment of riches on unspectacular journeymen. Mm. Um, but the the reality, in, in my mind, is that the all of the shortcomings on the PGA Tour should not and cannot justify embracing human rights abusers as the alternative because their interest is not in any noble purpose in, in the game or bettering golf in any way. Before you get into all that, which I want to hear, um, would it have made any difference to what the PGA Tour has done and reacted had this money been coming from a consortium based in London or Paris or anywhere that was looked upon as an in inverted commas acceptable I think it would have made life extremely difficult even more difficult than it already is for for Jay Monaghan and his crew and it might still do that someday in the future the what's overlooked in this argument over dirty money versus clean money is what is the intent if it was clean money let's say it was the premier golf league guys and it was venture fund capital that was financing it well that would be held to a conventional business profit and loss standard they would be looking for a return on investment the numbers that the saudis have offered players could never possibly amount to a return on investment because they were it's not a business it's the only return they're looking for is reputational it's sports washing and the idea that you could spend a collective billion dollars on golfers you're never going to see that money again it's not a business whereas the next people who come along and there, I assume there will be others the Saudis aren't going anywhere but there may be others as well but the clean money won't be at the same scale because the goal would be a business a viable business and that's not the goal with the Saudi enterprise mm. But you, again we were talking earlier and I think it was, I think it was you that said this about the, the interesting thing about the PG Tour is that they've they're pumping money into the players instead of into their product at the moment, which they could argue that's the same thing, but it isn't quite the same thing. No, and the you product know. changes will have to yeah. come. I mean, they're talking about doing these kind of quasi-team events, uh, at least three of them outside of the United States, and changing the fall schedule around to accommodate that. And those are all things they need to do, and you could argue that that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the the changes that they ought to see. But this is fundamentally the problem with a a member-driven organisation that is overly deferential to its members. And the issue with something like that is you can have a Dustin Johnson at the top of the world rankings. Well, he's got the exact same number or amount of influence or votes 
as a Patton Gazire or yeah. anybody else. It's there's an equality to it or an egalitarian nature mm. of these organisations that makes it difficult for somebody like a Monaghan or even a Keith Pelly on the other side of the pond, perhaps even more so under the structure of the DP World yeah. Tour for Pelly. Do you think benevolent dictatorship is what they need rather than di- democracy then? Not necessarily, yeah. but I, I also think that it's very difficult to convince athletes in an individual sport about the potential greater good, not just of the game, but simply of the the product and the viability of the product, because all of these guys have this... It, it's noticeable. All of them seem to have a, an increasingly inflated sense of what they're actually worth. And fair enough, some of them may be worth a, a great deal of money, but if if somebody told you, John, that you were worth... If the Saudis came to you and said, you were worth $50 million to us, and that's what we're willing to pay you to come work for us... It's very hard for you to then turn around and accept the idea that somebody else says, we actually, we think you're worth $2 million to come work for us. People will always gravitate towards the most flattering assessment of their own value. And that's what the Saudis have relied upon. And they're going to rely upon that with the tournaments they've scheduled because those tournaments will, for the most part, be filled with journeymen, primarily, I suspect, from the DP World Tour. And it then relies on the jealousy. They want the top players in the world who've said we're not going to sit there and look at, with no disrespect to a David Drysdale or anyone like that, who is handed a cheque for $4 million. And it's relying upon the ego and jealousy of the world's best players to say, oh, hang on, that's my money he's getting. I'm a better player yeah. than the guy who's won this tournament. And they're just hoping to kind of wait it out and wear people down. Well, and I do think there's a possibility that if they keep, if they start it up, like they look as if they're going to in five, or six years, seven years down the road, there's another generation of players coming out of college over here and wherever, from everywhere else around the world with no loyalty whatsoever to the tours, the established mm-hmm. tours. They're going to look at the money, as you just said. I mean, they're going to look at the 20 million rather than the 2 million. Yeah. It's just a matter of how much embarrassment they're willing to sustain between now and then in terms of having to run fields that basically are kind of like a, yeah. I was going to say a member guest, yeah. but I guess it would be a dismember Do guest you think like me case. that the, the significant line in Greg Norman's latest tirade, if you want, was that this is a startup? Yeah. You know. The language is awfully important under antitrust law in the United States. And, you know, Greg wrote that intemperate letter to Monaghan a few weeks ago, which was just... You think Greg wrote that letter? I think he wrote that one because it was so strikingly idiotic <laughs> that it, it, it would lead you to believe yeah. it was written by Greg. The letter that Greg sent to players a couple of weeks ago as they announced the schedule and inviting them to participate was very carefully crafted by a lawyer who's familiar with antitrust law because antitrust law hinges on the idea that the tour is this behemoth trying to illegally suppress a new rival, a startup, from getting into the competitive market space. Yeah. And that's the language that they are, are choosing to use here. And that's why Greg keeps referring to this idea of the tour suppressing alternatives, yeah. and mm-hmm. which the tour could very validly yeah. argue that yeah. they are not there. They're not telling any player they can't go play the any yeah. Super League. Yeah. Greg didn't Saudis. come up with that by himself. No, they're just, they're <laughs> telling players, you know, you if you want to play the Saudi thing, go, but you're not playing here at the same time. Yeah. And that's a very different thing. And that's probably a defense for the tour. I mean, it's been very interesting to watch Monaghan mostly work in the shadows on this rather than be out front and very vocal about it. Because I assume they've known from the start that the likely end game here is legal action. Who wins and, that, you think? Well, there's a great example. I, I was with friends recently who are lawyers where... They were arguing the antitrust case and they referred back to the startup, the US Football League that went up against the NFL here in the 1980s. And eventually the USFL sued the NFL for antitrust violations. And they won. But they were, it, it becomes complicated from there because it's what was the damage inflicted upon the USFL? And the, the court basically found that a lot of the, their failures owed to their own incompetence much more than the effects of any liability on the NFL's part. And they eventually they were awarded a dollar. And that is automatically tripled under antitrust law. And with interest, they eventually sent a check four years later 
by which point they were long shuttered for $3.76, which to this day has never been cashed. And I wonder where it is. <laughs> it's the, but that, that does speak to the, even if the tour is found liable for antitrust violations, they can restructure their own business and because there are defences, you know, you can have pro-competitive justification is the legal term for it. If they say, can you ban John Huggan because from your tour, because John Huggan wants to go play this tour, you can make an argument, even as an independent contractor, that they can do that because they will argue that John Huggan is an asset that we have invested in and built up on this tour. He's associated with our tour. We want no confusion as to which tour John Huggan is playing on. If he goes plays in this other tour and gets injured over there, that affects our business here. So you can make all of these kind of complicated legal arguments. And the tour has you know, office buildings full of lawyers in Manhattan who are prepared to make those arguments, as I'm sure the Saudis do on their behalf as well. So it's, not, it's very far from a clear-cut case that either side could win or lose. And even if one side wins, it might be a pyrrhic victory in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Again, going back to my original thing, with the, if this money had come from somewhere else, would you see this as a good thing for the pro game? Yeah, I, I have no objection to rivals to the to PGA Tour or forcing a rethink. I mean, I think the, the entire culture of the PGA Tour could use a refresh. I, and I, I blame Tim Fincham for so much of that over the years, just this culture of secrecy and the absence of transparency in there, but also the product in and of itself. And again, it comes back to, in large part to member-led organisations and they're generally risk averse. So there's a lot that needs to change on the PGA Tour and there's a lot more that needs to change than already has. I'm all for the idea of shaking up what the landscape of golf could look like. I just refuse to accept the notion that a reasonable alternative to that is people who go around chopping off heads of people who criticise them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you've, you know, very eloquently, you know, over a course of, I don't know how many columns you've written on this now, but it's it, maybe half a dozen over the last few months. You've, is it more than that? How many? Oh, uh, over the last two years, it's oh, well, yeah, I'm only more thinking, than a couple of uh, dozen. Yeah, thought. but I'm only thinking recently. You know, you, you, you've really gone to town on it recently. Um you know, it's an unarguable that that what you're saying. You know, why? How could you ever get into bed with these people? And and I went to Saudi, as you know. Mm-hmm. Um, we were the only, you know, Gulf Digest, the people I worked for. We were the only ones, the only journalist organization there that paid for everything. Mm-hmm. Everybody else was there on a freebie. Yeah. Not that there was many, but the, the, there was many interesting things that week. But the the, the thing that struck me was you know, we we've all watched tournaments on telly where you think, man, there's nobody there. There almost literally was nobody there yeah. to watch this. I mean, it was the surreal atmosphere. These the top, a lot of the top players in the world, and nobody watching them. Well, that, everything you know. comes back down to the fundamental reality here that there is no attempt to to use the nomenclature of bullshitters that you hear a lot of from players these days. There is no attempt to grow the game. They're not interested in getting no. kids or women or anyone else into watching yeah. the game over there, much less participating in it. It's reputational sports washing 101. Yeah. It doesn't get any more complicated than that. And uh, quite a few of the players, I mean, they they looked a bit sheepish in the press conferences. Well, they should. You know, and the, uh, you know they were. I mean, the Dustin Johnson. I mean, the, I actually asked him the question. I mean, it had been reported, I think, in the Daily Telegraph in in England that uh, Poulter, Ian Poulter, had been offered twenty million or whatever it was. And asked, I asked Dustin Johnson in the press conference, "Have you had a similar offer?" Which is, I'm not sure whether that was the right way to word it or not, but it turned out to be good because you go, oh no, not a similar offer. I've definitely had not had a similar offer that which meant it was way north of that. Yeah. You know, so he gave himself away. And and Lee Westwood told the world that he'd had a signed an NDA, mm-hmm. which I'm sure they all have. You know, because nobody's saying anything yet. Yeah. But um it's going to be very interesting to see if Phil Mickelson's at the Centurion Centurion Club in London in June, the week before the US Open. I I assume he has to be there. Given he's you know that he's he's clearly taking some money already. Well, I suspect there will be a lot of PGA Tour members there because that is simply another overseas event that players will ask the tour for a waiver to go compete on an Asian tour event. The well, tour no, has that's a long. A, that's a kind of not sort of special Asian tour event though, isn't it? I mean, it it's is, not, it, but it's they have given exemptions before for essential money grab yes, events. The yes. precedent is there. Right. What gets m- that's a bigger problem, the London event, um, 
for the tour in the sense that a lot of guys will, I assume, ask for waivers that will be granted. Mm. A month after that, July 1st to 3rd, is the Saudi event in Portland, Oregon. The PGA Tour bylaws do not even allow the consideration of granting members waivers to play events held against their own schedule. Even if their tour was so minded to do it, yeah. they can't do it. Yeah. And that, to me, becomes the the issue. What the Saudis are looking for is a test case of someone who's denied yeah. the waiver yeah. and sues, or someone who plays yeah. without the waiver is sanctioned by either tour on either side of the Atlantic and sues as a result of that. They need... The, the willing to step up. Yeah, the willing patsy yeah. who's willing to be a stooge for the Saudis for whatever amount of money is deposited into yeah. his account at the time. But that's really the end game of the schedule. Yeah. Um, I have to ask you about what you make of the Phil Mickelson saga, if you like. I mean, what, as, as an observer of that, what, what do you make of where he is now and where he was and the mistakes he's made and, you know, things that have been said and Alan Shipnuck's interview with him that was going to be in the book and now he's out there and there's all kinds of you know fringe stories going on here what have you made of it all I think you know I, I'd said on Golf Channel a few weeks ago this is what happens when you think you're Michael Corleone and you get exposed as Fredo yeah. Phil has always talked more than he listens and I mean you use the term you know the mistakes Phil has made I question whether or not Phil thinks he's made a mistake whenever he talked to Shipnuck uh, for those comments, which Shipnuck said happened back in November. It may well have been true that Phil said, you know, he's using them for leverage. He's ambivalent about whether or not the Saudis succeed. Yeah. Somewhere along the way, that changed. Phil jumped horses. Phil is working for the Saudis. In the statement he put out announcing that he was taking a break from the game, he used the phrase worked with yeah. in reference to the Live Golf Investments crew, the Saudis, under the anodyne name that they use to cover up who they are. Yeah. But Phil was on that side of the fence. And Greg Norman did a podcast a couple of weeks ago with Gary Williams in which he said that he talked to Phil a couple of days earlier. Now, Phil's gone to ground with everyone else, but he's still talking to the Saudis. Mm. So to me, that's also an indication of, of where he is. It's been a spectacular fall from grace. And what, what's striking to me, you know, we saw, if you want to talk about falls from grace for different reasons, if you go back to Tiger's personal issues a dozen or so years ago, and which ultimately were nobody's business except his and his own family's. Yeah. But you saw a lot of players offer support for him and remind people that it was no one else's business. Yeah. You have not seen players offer a scintilla of support for Phil Mickelson because they, you know, it's, it's open season on him now. The way he's grated on people in the locker room over the years, the realisation that Phil, it's not just that Phil had decided that he was leaving the house because he preferred to live in the house across the street. It's a Phil was trying to torch the house that you're in on the way out. Mm. And it, it creates issues even for Phil's management company. I mean, they've got 40 players trying to live and work in the house that Phil was trying to burn down. Yeah. So where do you sort of maintain relationships in that? And it, it's just been striking to watch the the level of disregard that exists for Phil. You know, you saw the comments by... Rory and Justin Thomas and Pat Perez and a bunch of other guys about using words like selfish, egotistical, stupid. Tour players do not talk about each other no. in that kind of way. You just don't hear it. They can actually be fined by the tour yeah. for speaking of each other yeah. in public and nobody, in that way. nobody has, I don't think. No, I guarantee you not a single person has been sanctioned that is interesting. for that. Yeah. And I, mean, I do not expect to see Phil Mickelson at Southern Hills a month from now defending his PGA title. Really? I, I, I do not think we are likely to see Phil. I don't believe Phil has been suspended. Whether or not he was discouraged from being here, who knows? Well, the I, internal I, I can't imagine they wanted him to be the two-day story early in the week. You know, total distraction I wouldn't think them. so, but yeah. whether or not they were willing to try to ensure that didn't happen, I don't know. I mean, none of us really know the internal workings of, no. of Augusta National, but... All the sources I've talked to insist that Phil has not been suspended by the tour. I talked to one player last week, a, a major champion, who insists that if Phil does return to the tour of his own volition, he should be suspended then because he has to feel the wrath of the tour. So everything I can deduce from the sources I've talked to, this is a, a willing thing on Phil's part. I guess he's got a lot of bridges to mend in a lot of different places, but... I don't 
buy into this notion that I've, I keep arguing with friends over where they talk about Phil working his way back. That assumes that Phil has any desire to work his way back. Phil yeah. may well have simply chosen that he's now yeah. on the other team because all of these changes we're talking about at the tour, you know, the guaranteed money events, all of these bonus pools, the increased prize funds, all of this stuff is meaningless in a lot of ways to Phil because he doesn't play well enough right now consistently to benefit yeah. from it. I mean, it makes sense in the, in the from the thing that he's he's not really competitive, as you say, on the PGA Tour anymore, despite the fact that he's a reigning major champion, which is complete anomaly, really. He doesn't care about the senior tour. He, did, he couldn't care less about that. So what's what's keeping him in place? Nothing, really. Well, you know. clearly the game here, under the current structure, cannot give Phil as much as he needs as fast as he clearly needs it. There, You just get this sense that there's an impatience in Mickelson over the last couple of months. And, you know, he's he spent years undermining every organisation in the game, you know, all the way back to, you go back to the task force that he wrested the Ryder Cup away from the PGA of America. Mm. His constant belittling of the USGA as amateurs. Now, you spend a lot of time around USGA people. They make mistakes in course setup. Mm. You don't think that they've done a good job in enforcing rules on equipment and anything like that. All of those things are entirely valid criticisms, but they're not amateurs in terms of what they're yeah. doing. Yeah. They're, they are professionals doing that job. Yeah. But Phil has been playing this game for a long time and you saw the early signs of it months earlier when he started repeating Saudi talking points about the percentage of revenue that the tour was returning to players like him, which are numbers that he just pulls out of yeah. thinner, abject lies. And he either was a willing stooge for those lies or was simply misinformed. But he had been spouting the Saudi talking points for a long time in public before he kind of immolated himself over the last couple of months. And, you, you know, you talked to enough players out on tour that a round where they were paired with Phil became nightmarish because it was a five-hour recruitment drive for the Saudis. Yeah. Uh, so the idea that Phil is attempting to work his way back to the tour, uh, there's no evidence of that yet. It may come at some point if he realises that he's on the wrong side of this and nobody else is jumping with him. Yeah. I, I'm not convinced they're at well, that point yet. Yeah, I agree because, he, I mean, in the sense that he's he's certainly going to make more money playing on the Saudi tour, if you like, than he is playing on the PGA tour going forward. Yeah, that, you know, that's definitely a reasonable assumption. Yeah. Maybe he's got some kind of equity stake in it as well. If he is that deep in, which mm. by his own admission, he's been working with him and I'm sure he's not necessarily doing it out of the goodness of his heart. But it's... It, it was so striking, the comments to Shipnuck where he said that he's fully cognizant of all of the abuses involved with the Saudi regime, mm. but he needed the leverage over Jay Monaghan and that was enough. And to, I could not imagine a more morally bankrupt position any individual mm. could take. And it, it was, to me, laughable that at one point in his statement, Phil accused Monaghan of... The, f- the phrase he used was coer- coercive strong arm tactics. Well, show me anybody that Jay Monaghan beheaded with a bone saw. Yeah. If you want to talk about strong arm yeah. coercive tactics, that is Phil's benefactors yeah. in Riyadh. Yeah. And it's, I, there's a lot of commercial aspects to this whole rivalry and the idea of a splinter tour that probably could turn out to be positives in terms of generating some real change on either yeah. side of the Atlantic. Yeah. And, and how this professional yeah. game is run, but, but I whole, can't get past the human rights issues. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think anybody would, nobody was going to disagree with that. But I tell you what was interesting to me when I was in Saudi, and it, it, whether it's as interesting to you, I don't know. But I didn't know what I was expecting. But the, I was staying on the the campus of the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, which is this massive campus surrounded by this very high wall with gun towers at each entrance, you know, pointed at the, the roads and whatnot. But I had a wee wander out of the wee hotel I was staying in just to see what was going on. And there was a supermarket that looked just like a supermarket here or in Britain anywhere. That You know, all the companies that you would associate with supermarket goods, they were all in there. Mm -hmm. There was KFC, there was Burger King, there was, you know. And I went into the bathroom, as you do, in in my hotel, and there was Kohler Mm -hmm. written on the the system, you know, like it is just as it is here. So there's an awful lot of the world feasting on the, the trough, in the trough that is Saudi Arabia as well. Yeah, you know, it, that would, and that in no way justifies, you know, what they do. But, you know, where do you draw the line? Well, there's, you know, there's, there are means of, by which regimes like that normalize themselves. And to a European 
golf rider who goes there and sees, or even professional golfers, you see the familiarity of, of products mm, and yeah. quality of hotel experience and all of that. But again, you're, you're talking about a golf course with nobody on it and gun towers pointing down yeah. at the road. Well, That's it, the fundamental I wasn't reality. comfortable. Yeah, what, yeah, you, yeah. what your experience is as a tourist is obviously very different from Saudi citizens' experience and certainly d- different from the citizens in Yemen that they're dropping missiles on on a daily basis as well. Yeah. So where where do you think this ends, just before we wrap up? I mean, where, where, where do you see the next few months, years, whatever? Oh, I think we could be dead before this ends, Yeah, John. Uh, I, <laughs> well, I, I might be. You're a, bit, you're a wee bit younger than me, I think. Yeah, but I live a little harder than <laughs> you these days. It's, I think there's, the litigation is inevitable. I think it will be drawn out. I... I still think the Saudis have a real uphill battle in front of them just because they, even if they do succeed in an antitrust case, it doesn't necessarily make their product any more viable or tolerable to people. And I think only recently the players really started to realise the extent to which public opinion will drag them through the mud for the association because it's clearly for money. You saw Harold Varner who won the Saudi Yeah. International said at the players that he was kind of shaken by the social media reaction to that. And then he then proceeded to declare his loyalty to the, the PGA Tour going forward. And, you know, people would have looked at Harold Varner, somebody who's willing to go yeah. for the appearance for Saudi Arabia and wins. Well, he was one of the names mentioned as a possibility that for to jump, if you like. Yeah, yeah. As, as, as many others have yeah. been as yeah. well. But I think the little window that these guys have gotten in terms of how visceral the public reaction is. Because you go from, you know, they're accustomed to golf media that's largely toothless. They're accustomed to golf fans who lavish praise on them all the time. But then you suddenly move into the broader sports fan world, the broader sports media world and the broader news media world. Mm. And they will get spit roasted for that because it's very clear what they're doing and why. And these prevarications about growing the game... (laughs) It's just, they become, I mean, they're already embarrassing and so intellectually dishonest on every level that at least I would give Shane Lowry credit when he went there. He basically said he was doing it for the money. I don't think it makes it particularly any more admirable, but at least he yeah. wasn't Yeah, but he, the he got slaughtered in the Irish press. He yeah. did. Yeah. And because also Shane said, well, I, that it, he had the defence, you know, I'm not a politician, which was also Bryson's line. Yeah. Well, the playing in that tournament is an eminently political act may not be on your part, but that's why the Saudis have invited you. It's a political act on their part yeah. for the purposes of sports washing, which is essentially a political process by which they normalise mm. their activities. Yeah. So the players who've gotten slaughtered in the press, I think it's... It, and look at what has happened to Mickelson, whose entire reputation built up over 30 years was torched virtually overnight. Yeah. And... Players will look at that, and who wants to be the next one? Yeah, I mean the, the, the Saudis are they're, they're no daft, and the the you know when the price of oil rocketed recently, and obviously their leverage over the rest of the world that therefore increased that famous word leverage. They, that they chose that weekend to chop off eighty one heads, you know, because that was you know we can get away with it kind of thing at this and point. Forced, I assume, out of expediency because he clearly has no shame it forced Greg Norman to wait an extra couple of days before he announced on the following Tuesday Mm. what his schedule was going to be but maybe Greg should realise that it's a little hard to grow the game when you're busy chopping off the heads of people who would play it What do you make of him in the midst of all this? I think Greg Norman has shown who he is he's a man absolutely devoid of character devoid of integrity and devoid of shame that's what he's reduced himself to at this point That's a pretty low bar Well, Greg could limbo dance under that bar. I have one last question before we finish. I'm conscious I've kept you here for almost an hour and a half. You must be sick of the sight of me by now. Um, Who's going to win the Masters? If I knew that, I'd be running down to the bookies shop right now. I I look at a guy like Scotty Scheffler, not just the wins. Is he really the best player in the world, though? I mean, I have a hard time with that. The rankings generally do have a recency bias. Yes, yeah. And, you know, he's... He has the form, obviously, with three of the last five, but he's been around the fringes of majors. Now, he's got, he's been in the top 20 in his last six majors. He's had four top eights yeah, okay. in that he's time. He's clearly a player. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. And he's got, he's got all the confidence 
in the world. Whereas I look, you know, I look at a John Ram and John Ram finishes really well in a lot of events, but he hasn't won at all since Tory Pines. If I was going to bet on somebody, I would probably lean towards Justin Thomas more than I, you know, he's, he's clearly one of the best iron players in the world. He needs the putter to behave a little better than it has been consistently of late. But it's, it's amazing how many of the top guys in the world I wouldn't necessarily have a great deal of favour. You know, Patrick Cantley hasn't, doesn't have a great record in the majors. Hasn't been in the top 10 since three years ago here. I look at Victor Hovland, who's so good for this game, so endearing to watch play. Yeah, he almost looks like he's, he's either smiling or about to smile. Yeah, yeah. and there's just something very endearing of watching him. And a terrific player who's gotten to number three in the world. But there are 213 guys on the PGA Tour who are ranked in these strokes gained around the green yeah, category. Who, who can chip better than him, yeah. yeah and he, oh. Victor's 208th. And heading into the players, Victor was 213th. There was literally nobody worse yeah. on tour. And that's the kind of weakness that I think really gets exposed around here. And you know, the same reason I would say Morikawa, wonderful iron player, great disposition, as well, great ambassador for this game. Is the, the shortest club in the bag a little wobbly for him on under pressure on these kind of greens. It wasn't at Royal St. George's. He made everything that mattered. Yeah. But uh, again, it's a slightly different story here. You look at a guy like Spieth, who said it, last week was his worst putting week of his career, but he's come here in the doldrums before and played yeah. his way yeah. into made, it. This place is made for him. Yeah, yeah. if I was going to bet, I would say JT or potentially Cameron Smith. I don't necessarily put a lot of stock in the fact that Cameron was second here in November of 2020 because that was the asterisk major yeah. for me just because the course was so soft yeah. at that time of the year but he, he's a guy I'd really look at I don't see Tiger being realistically there I think Rory's got swing issues right now Xander Shoffley seems to be good for top 10 finishes in half the majors he's, he's played his career T8 written all over him yeah. yeah yeah, he doesn't have a win in, in more than four years at this point a good dark horse I think Shane Lowry you know he played really well at the Honda he's had a couple of top 15 finishes since and he's got one of the best short games in the world he can chip you know one of the great things is to watch him and Harrington having their chipping contests have you watched that I have there was yeah. a, quite the foursome headed off today it was Rory Harrington Shane Lowry and Seamus Powers. That's a lot of indecipherable accents it is. out there as well. Yeah, it's a lot of Irish going on there. Yeah, there's yeah. at least three Irish caddies in that group heading That's out true. there as well. That's true Maybe too. four. Yeah. So anyway, on that note, uh, Eamon, thank you for your time. It's been a fascinating listen, certainly for me. I hope the, the listeners agree. And uh, thanks for your time. Always a pleasure, John. I'd have to say that if you've got any interest in anything to do with golf beyond your own score you would have found something of interest in that interview. A big thanks to Eamon for taking the time to be a part of it. It's no small commitment. That's it for episode 63. We look forward to your company again next time on The Thing About Golf. Golf.